I mean, we were told when we got there that our goal in life was to survive a week, uh, take as many of them with us as we could before we'd go, and uh, try to make them use as many of their expendables as we could, and that the follow-on forces from the states would win the war. Did you believe that? If it had happened, yeah. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Rick Shreve was a US Air Force F-111 pilot based at RAF Lakenheath in the UK. We hear about his early Air Force career as a fighter pilot, and then we move on to his transfer to the F-111 and how he was trained to carry out nuclear as well as conventional missions against the Warsaw Pact forces in Europe. He describes his low-level training missions to attack targets in the Soviet Union and East Germany, where he recalls a near-fatal incident amongst the Scottish locks. Rick was also part of one of the crews that flew on Operation El Dorado Canyon, the operation to bomb Libya in April 1986 in retaliation for the West Berlin discotheque bombing 10 days earlier. Rick gives you a very frank and honest view of his role in the US Air Force and his approach to the huge responsibilities he carried. In his later career he flew civil airliners with Pan Am and recalls how he was astonished to fly over the Warsaw Pact airfield he had been tasked to attack in the event of war. Now, if you have listened this far, I know that you are enjoying the podcast, so I'm asking for one-off or monthly donations to support my work and enable me to continue producing the podcast. If you become a monthly supporter via Patreon, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. So back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Rick to our Cold War Conversation. Originally, I was planning on going to the Naval Academy. And um, for various and sundry reasons, I ended up getting out of high school when I was 16. And you had to be 17 to go to the academy. So my uh, representative, and that's one of the people that can give me an appointment to the academy, told me to go ahead and go to college for a year, then come back, and he'd uh, give me a uh, – we, we'd deal with it then. Went down to Texas, left around at Texas A&M, which at the time was a boys' school and a military school. On our way back up, stopped by at Baylor in Waco. Uh, nice campus, friendly people, plus they had girls. And <laughs> at that time, uh, in the early 70s, uh, A&M was boys' school. So I figured, well, I'll go here for a year and then, and then go apply to the Naval Academy. So while I was there, uh, I got offered a full-ride scholarship with the Air Force and decided to stay. So that's how I ended up there. So I kind of backed into it, to be honest with you. Can you take me through some of the training that you had there? It's, it's probably like, uh, you know, your air cadet squadrons there with the RAF. Uh, some academics, uh, drill, you know, things that you'd probably do in boot camp. They do in the four years that you're there. And then between your sophomore and your junior year, you have three years of, of uh, college in the States. So between the, the second and the third year, you go to a four-week summer camp. And they just kind of increase the intensity a little bit. And you get what's called a dollar ride. We get to go up in an airplane just to see if you like it. And then you graduate and you get your commission and you go to whatever uh, professional training or whatever your uh, job is going to be in the Air Force. They send you the training for that after you graduate and actually come on board. Right. So, so presumably they saw your suitability as a pilot at this point or not. Oh, well, yeah, one thing I forgot, uh, the summer between your junior and your senior year, between year three and year four, you go to uh, primary uh, flight training. And this is in the States. They contract this out to civilians. 
So you just go to a local airport, get in a 150, and fly up to the point to where you get your private pilot's license. It's about 40 hours. So you solo, you get your private pilot's license. And to be honest with you, this is where most of the people get washed down is at that point. It seems strange, but the simpler the airplane is, it seems like the harder it is to fly. So then you you move on to more ad, advanced aircraft and more advanced training. Right. Um, this was 74 when I graduated, and they were starting to to re- do a reduction in force called a RIF, and they were dumping guys out with, you know, 1,000 hours of combat time. Uh, and they had been putting through flight school classes that numbered in the hundreds. The class I went through was 20. The, uh, I had to wait a year before I could get into flight school, so I was a cop for a year in the Air Force. And then after a year, my actual flying training started. Tell me about the, the flying training. Flying training back then, it was in two phases. The first phase was T-37. Um, side by side, it was kind of like a, the jet provost, except it had two engines. Um, that, that's where you actually learned to fly, was in the T-37. Uh, and you got trained to the point to where you could fl- you could actually pass the uh, uh, air transport pilot license test for the FAA. So it was instruments, formation, flying, general aircraft handling. Then after about so four to five months, you transitioned into the T-38. And back then, everybody went through the T-38. And that was more of a fighter-type aircraft. It would go supersonic, uh, tandem seat. Again, formation, instrument flying, general aircraft handling. And it was during the time you were in the T-38 where they decided what type of airplane you were going to get. It, the, the, theory, the theory back then was that you were universally assignable. If you made it through the T-37 and T-38, you could fly anything up. It wasn't necessarily the case, and they changed that now. We're after the first half of training now in the Air Force, you're split off into a fighter or tanker transport. And and did you feel that you 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 had quite a gift in terms of your flying ability? Did you find it quite easy and you were quite confident? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, no, I had to work at it, to be honest with you. And to be honest with you, I was kind of surprised I got a fighter out of there. I got an F-4 uh, when I graduated. Then after you got out of uh, flight school, they sent you to a program called Fighter to Lead In. It was about a month. It was in um, New Mexico. It was T-38s, but they had like you could drop bombs and stuff like that. It was just basic fighter maneuvers, basic bombing, a little more formation just to see if, you know, just to get you uh, ginned up a little bit without having to pay the cost of flying an F-4 uh, at the initial part. Then after that, I went to F-4 RTU training in McDill. F4Es, and uh, got some of the best training I ever had in my life. Uh, F4 was probably the best airplane for a new fighter pilot to go to because you did everything. You did nukes, you did a uh, ground attack, you did air to air, you did intercept. So you learned it all. Then after that, I was transferred to uh, Seymour Johnson for Tech Fighter Wing, which interestingly enough, the three squadrons there had started down as Eagle Squadrons in the RAF, and we were an air to air wing. And this is where, and this is typical Air Force. I was a really good air to air pilot. Cannot understand why. I just got it. And it's 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 something it's something either you got or you don't, because it's such a complex, three dimensional, high speed. You got to keep track of where everybody is, and a lot of guys just just can't handle all the the inputs and the thought process that goes into it. I got it. I couldn't teach it. I was worthless in debriefs because it just it came naturally to me. And I, and I found that if you're a natural at something, you can't teach it because you don't know why you do what you do. Now, I was a ter- terrible bomb dropper. I mean, you know, when I first started, <laughs> the only reason the bomb hit the ground was because of gravity. But <laughs> I got to where I was really good at it, but I had to work at it. And so I had to work at it. I was really good at teaching it. I could teach bombing. Couldn't teach air to air for for nothing. Now, they used to give us these little microphones, and we take off, and and you're supposed to turn it on and talk about what you're doing and what you see. You know, see Top Gun? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when they're debriefing, that's that's pretty much what you do. You get back there, 
you fly for, you know, air to air mission and that four is probably 30 minutes. But it was like 30 minutes pulling five and six G's and you come back and you feel like somebody beat you with a baseball bat. But, um, so you come back and you spend two or three hours debriefing the flight and you're supposed to play back your, your recorder, you know, so you say, okay, this is where we are. This is what he's doing. This is what I'm doing. And all mine was, was me grunting and, and cussing a guy. And, <laughs> and I, and they were asking, why did you do this? And I go, yeah, I don't know. It just, it seemed like the thing to do at the time. So since I really had a gift for it, that was the last time I ever flew air to air. We switched to about the year after I got to Seymour Johnson, we got our mission changed from air to air to ground attack and nuke. Now that was a real morale builder right there. And we got matched up with squadrons in Ramstein and we'd go over there in the summer and set nuke alert. And this was with the F4 Phantom, yeah. Yeah, with the F4s, yeah. So so you were over in Germany with the F4 as well. No, I was supposed to be, but by the time it took us a, a year to transition. Uh, well, probably six to nine months to transition from air to air to nuke because they're real picky about nukes. I can imagine. You can imagine them being picky, can't you? It was, I'll be honest with you, it was the most miserable experience of my life. We worked 12, 13 hour days, six, seven days a week for, you know, six months in a row without a day off to get ready for our, our initial nuke evaluation. And that thing, one guy messes up, whole wing fails. Wow. So the, no pressure. And you had to do the thing that uh, we, we called it stump the dummy. But what it was is you, you'd brief your, you had a line, a mission, and you'd get up and you'd brief what you're going to do, how you're going to get there. Pilot would talk about what he'd expected to see visually. Wizzo would talk about what he expected to see on the radar, how we were going to deliver our weapons. And then oh, nuclear certifications, that's what they were called. Each crew had to do one. And then there was like a table full of experts around the table after you did your briefing. And each one of these guys, like you'd have like a weapons guy, you'd have a maintenance guy, you'd have a plans guy. They didn't know crap about anything other than their own little bailiwick. And after you did your briefing, you'd stand up there. And I mean, I've, I've been up there for like two, three hours answering questions just and not looking at anything. Just you're supposed to know it. Was there any sort of extra psychological evaluation with nukes or not? Probably think, I think that probably comes under don't ask questions you can't stand the answer to. <laughs> It, it's, it was a different world back then. I mean, I went back to Lake and Heath a couple of years ago, and some of the people I went said, well, you're gonna have, they going to have you talk to the pilots? I went, yeah, no. We're like pirates to them. It, it, the, the culture has changed so much that, yeah, yeah, they don't want us speaking to these guys. Yeah, I mean, they, they kind of probably played a little bit more attention to you. As, uh, yeah, well, yeah, not in the fighters. They didn't. They, I mean, they pretending like they did, but they didn't. We're, we were not a deep, introspective group. I mean, pretty much what you saw was what you got. I just wanted to go quickly back to the, the training side, because I understand you were training with some royalty as well. Yeah, the my flight school class, <laughs> half of it, uh, like I say, they were like, we start out with 20 Americans and they got called down about 15. Then they dumped a bunch of Kuwaitis in with us and uh, it included a crown prince of Kuwait. Al Sabah, I believe his name was, and uh, that was different. Those guys were. <laughs> we had a bunch of Iranians on base too, and you talk about two groups of people just hated each other's guts. The Kuwaitis <laughs> and the Iranians couldn't 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 stand each other. We'd have to play soccer since they, you know, was part of our athletic program, which we hated. But I mean, that's the only thing they knew how to play, and they'd be in time fighting as opposed to playing soccer. And, well, we just kind of watch them. And wonder what what the big deal was, but yeah, he was there. Oh, well, one one interesting story though. Uh, when we did our nuclear certification, uh, they brought some guys over from NATO in uh, USAFE Air Forces Europe to do the certification, since we were going to actually be sitting alert over in, in Germany. And so I'm up there, and we're doing okay. And then this plans guy from NATO goes, uh, "Well, uh, Captain Shree, why don't you just basically summarize the?" Uh, uh, contents of NATO op plan Mukti Mutt. I'm sitting there thinking a minute. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't have any earthly idea what this guy's talking about. 
and I'm just getting ready to start tap dancing and BSing this guy. And I just went, looked at my wisdom and said, you heard of that? And he goes, no. I look at him and said, Major, I don't have any earthly idea what you're talking about. And the wing commander, you could just see him like melt. Because he thought, okay, this is it. This moron has cost the wing our certification. But then the NATO plans guy looks over at our plans and I says, you all did get that, Ted. And it's a new pub. I said, no, so we haven't gotten it. He goes, well, Captain, I guess you wouldn't know it, would you? And I went, yeah, I guess not. Wow, it's a good job you didn't go down the BS route. Well, then, I, it? it was <laughs> it was mighty tempting. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant stuff. So with with the F four, I mean, for some, you end up as an instructor, don't you? At some point, I was a simulator instructor in F fours, and then after F fours, I got sent to uh, T, to be a T thirty seven instructor in Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock. I was an instructor there for three years, and then after that, they I was fully expecting to go back to the F-4 or hopefully an F-15. But then for some reason, they decided that I'd be really good for an F-111, which I wasn't thrilled about because they had them stationed over at Cannon Air Force Base, which is about 100 miles away from Lubbock. And they just didn't, they were just having so much trouble with that with the planes and the engines and the airframes. They just didn't fly. I mean, they'd sat for months without turning the wheel. But then they said I was going to go to Lake and Heath in England. I went, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to sit around somewhere. I just didn't sit around over there. So I got transferred over there, and we had the F model 111s, and that was probably the best model we had, and we flew a lot. We didn't have the trouble that they had with the Ds, D models at Canon. How different is it flying an F111 versus the F4? It's a, it's a different airplane. It's a different culture. It's a different mindset. Um, F4, man, the first thing you want to do is dump your bombs and, and start hassling. You know, you, you want that air-to-air -air kill if you can. F-111, it's, you know, drop your bombs, run away. Uh, it, had abs it had zero air-to-air <laughs> -air capability. I mean, unless you're, like, fighting a space shuttle or something, you might have a chance with that. But other than that, you're, you're a bomb dropper. I think I read there was an interesting defensive maneuver called torching. Well, torching and, and biffing. Torching is but tonight the in the F one eleven the dump mast is in between the burner cans when you dump fuel. So what we do at at night if we were bored or if somebody was chasing us at night or at air shows was you start dumping fuel and you light one of the afterburners and you get about a forty foot flame shooting out of the back of the plane. I mean it's the most awesome thing uh, that you can see. I mean the burners on the F four excuse me the F one eleven are impressive to begin with. You can see them in the daytime the burners coming out and then you have about a 40, 50 foot flame come out of the back end of that thing. That'll, that'll get your attention. Plus it'll blind you at night if somebody's behind you. And then the other thing is, is a lot of times we carried retarded bombs, the bombs with parachutes on them. Mm -hmm. And if somebody was behind us, uh, the fence we were going to use is we were going to drop one off. So it would, you know, she'd come out and fall behind us and it'd blow up in front of him. And and that was really the only, yeah. Well, our our, def our defense was the terrain falling radar and speed, because we'd go like a striped button monkey, and there wasn't anything that could catch like us a, down. Like a like a what? Did you say <laughs> striped <laughs> button monkey? Sorry, it's just a term we used. It goes really brilliant. fast. That's a great. That's a great term. I I might be using that in the future. <laughs> well, we actually well you you can edit this part out. The really term is a striped ass ape, but. <laughs> Oh yeah, you you don't need to uh, censor for this show. Don't okay. don't worry. You take out what don't you worry. Take out. Don't worry, Rick. Because um, because I understand the the F one eleven was the only plane without an airspeed limit, or is that yeah? A myth? It, and again, I may be mistaken on this. It's been so long since I looked in the dash one, but I believe it is. It, it didn't have a Q limit. It had a temperature limit. It started to burn up, and I had and there was a warning light in the cockpit that all it said was slow down. <laughs> it, there was a, a temperature sensor on the on the skin of the airplane, and there was actually a little gauge that showed you how high it was getting. And when it got too hot, the slow down light would come on. I got to come on one time, but that was, and that was it. So well, what was the sort of uh, limit you managed to take an F-111 to? It was... Uh, between Christmas and New Year's, and, and you guys shut down, I mean, RAF's flying club. So between Christmas and New Year's, you guys just took the rest of your off. 
us, we had to go fly and burn off all the excess gas we had as opposed to saving it for the next year because it was a budget thing. So we just go, you know, we couldn't get on the range, couldn't fly low level, couldn't do anything. Uh, so we're just out there drilling holes in the sky. And I was up with a whistle one time and we're cruising along. We're just, you know, trying to figure out something to do to, to kill the time. I went, how, how fast have you ever been? He says, oh, probably 1.5, 1.6. I went, man, let's see how fast this thing will go. So talk to Scottish military radar. I don't know if you're aware of it, but in the UK back then there was civilian radar control, air traffic control, and then there was military air traffic control. Right. And we dealt with, dealt with the military guys. So where we were, it was Scottish military radar. And so he just points us out toward Norway and says, let her rip. And uh, we got 2.02 when the paint started burning off. <laughs> wow. And I've had it down to, I think I was going 1.2, 1.3 at 100 feet at red flag one time. At 100 feet off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Now that you can tell you that that you can tell you're going fast. You got to trust in your terrain following radar for that, surely. I was, I was hand flying that one. You can only go down 200 feet with the TFRs. Hand flying at 100 feet. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. yeah that's what I got paid for. Yeah. You know, other than that, they have monkey do it. <laughs> the buttered monkey. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That that's in, that's incredible. What what were your first impressions of the UK when you arrived? Like living in the States in the 40s. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you never knew what your telephone number was because, you know, it's like our my phone number where we live was Castle Lake or 241. But the numbers, you know, you dial depending on where you were. You know, you had to go in the call box and get out the little chart and it told you what, you know, prefix numbers you had to use you know, based upon where you're calling from. And, and and you could actually hear the mechanical switches click over as it went through the transfer stations. Yeah, yeah. To finally get to where you were going. And we got mail twice a day. That was nice. And nobody ever did anything on the phone. It was always my letter. Yeah. And, but uh, we, we made a conscious effort. Um, we lived in this great big old... Uh, well, we call it a mansion. Big old country house about 20 miles outside of the base. We, we made a conscious effort that we were going to live amongst the natives. So um, we lived in the house. We were the only Americans in the village. It was a little village called Sporl up near Swatham. Sent my, sent my kid to English schools. Uh, I was the number three employer in the, in the village, <laughs> the pub and the school. But uh, we loved it. I mean, it, it took a while to get used to it. Like, first thing that we noticed when, like, we'd go out, uh, you know, in the States, you go out, you go eat, you go to a movie, you go do this, you know, you know, you do two or three things at, in the evening. You know, I don't know what it's like now, but back in the 70s, man, when you booked a table, you booked it for the night. And they were in no rush. You know, in, in U.S. restaurants, man, it's, okay, eat, get out, so I, can, so I can turn this table and get some more people in. I mean, U.K., you just come in and it's yours. And it was, it was a more leisurely, laid-back pace of life, and it took us about six months to get used to it. But once you did, I really liked it. And natives were friendly, and they kind of spoke the language. So <laughs> um, other than y'all driving on the wrong side of the road, it was pretty nice. Did you get a, a U.S. car shipped over? <laughs> MG shipped over. I had an MG in the States and it was a uh, uh, left hand drive. And uh, then we got a, a Mazda, Brit Mazda over here when we got there. Uh, and when I, when I went for the MOT, they were just amazed because they've been in Texas its whole life. So there wasn't a speck of rust on this thing. Plus the left hand drive, it was just, it was odd. How, how did you like the warm English beer? I'm not a big not a big beer drinker, but the one bad habit I did pick up was single malt scotch. <laughs> I learned then that scotch, redheads, and midgets are proof that God truly loves us. We had a little little old Scottish guy ran the bar at Lake and Heath. And, uh, you know, I'd go up and order a scotch, and he said, I guess you want ice and water. And I said, no, I want, it, I want it straight like God meant for me to drink it. And he goes, you're a fine lad. <laughs> Um, how how different was it flying in the UK and Europe versus what you'd experienced in the US? 
Well, you know, in the U.S., it's just one set of rules. And um, you couldn't – they had these low-fly uh, routes. There's only certain places, only certain routes you could fly low-level in the States. Now, there were a lot of them. But, you know, you just flew the same ones over. I mean, there's ones around Seymour Johnson I could go fly right now without the chart because I've flown so many times. Uh, UK, man, don't fly over London. Don't fly over to Queen's house. Pretty much go anywhere you want. The uh, German rules were a little restrictive. The Dutch, you couldn't mow below 1,000 feet. That was, that was probably the hardest thing because our missions were pretty long. A lot of time we take off, we'd be flying in England, Belgium, Holland, Netherlands. Uh, maybe over into France a little bit. So you had to know, A, when you crossed the border, and B, when the rules changed. But, uh, I mean, after you did it a while, it was okay. But as far as it was, I love flying low level in England. It was great. So were you up in Scotland around the locks and places like that? Yeah, we flew up in Scotland mainly. Uh, we had nine squadron. They were flying uh, tornadoes. And a lot of times we get noise complaints called in from the locals and we go, uh, I don't think that was us. Uh, you know, it's, we're pretty sure it was the tornadoes over nine squadron. If you call wing commander Jones at, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure he'll be happy to handle your inquiry. <laughs> Besides we have specific rules that prohibit that sort of activity. So it couldn't have been us. Yeah. But yeah, we mainly went up the North of England and Scotland. Yeah. I've seen some really incredible YouTube footage, I think of, uh, low level lock runs. <laughs> yeah. 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 The lock runs, um, which look pretty low to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's all a matter of, uh, it, it, it's all relative. It's what you're used to. You know, first time you fly terrain falling radar at night and the weather it's, you know, your butt's so clenched up you couldn't drive a needle up it with a sledgehammer. And after about, you know, six months of doing it, it's you know, another day at the office. I mean, you pay attention to what you're doing, but it's just it's just the tension's not there. You get used to it. Um, were, were you trained at all in escape and evasion? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's the great thing about the 111 was this, the escape capsule. It was great for getting out, but it was a really hard to bury um, once you got on the ground. But yeah, you went through a week-long escape and evasion training up in uh, Sp outside of Spokane, Washington. I did mine in January, or no, February, so it was really awesome to be up there in the mountains, you know, 10 foot of snow being chased by gomers, you know, and then you spent, they caught you, and then you spent a couple of days in a POW camp, and then kind of as a reward, you got to go down to uh, Homestead uh, next to Miami for water survival. And that's where you, they like parasailed you off this boat, landed in the water, got on the, uh, the raft, floated around for a couple of hours and they come pick you up. And did, did you, I mean, because with some of the RAF guys I've interviewed, you know, there's the sort of semi roughing up in interrogation and. Yeah, man, they got a lot of money invested in me. They're not going to smack me around too much. <laughs> a lot of times you, you go, you, at least when I was, in the camp, you'd piss off a guard, so they go in there to interrogate you because it was warm. The room they took into the interrogate you was nice and warm. You go, yeah, yeah, do what you want, pal, but it's not cold. So, yeah, they it wasn't it it wasn't much, to be honest with you. They they taught you some techniques and stuff like that, and, and I'll be honest with you, the missions we were going on. <laughs> I, it wasn't something you had to worry about. No, we'll we'll come on to that in a in a moment, Rick. But I I appreciate that. I mean, you mentioned a little while earlier the F one eleven escape capsule, and I guess some people listening might not realise that essentially the whole of the cockpit section is ejected and parachutes down. So you're not coming down on individual parachutes. No, you're coming down together, sitting in your seat, and really it's kind of nice because. One, you know, you, you're not uh, exposed to all the wind blast and stuff and get your story straight on the way down. And you got all your – you don't worry about you landing somewhere in the whistle, landing someplace else and trying to get together and your crap flying all over the place. Everything is there once you hit the ground. But the other thing is you're not hiding that thing once it gets on the ground. And and presumably these things could float as well. They had flotation aids. Yeah, they were like – they had uh, uh, pumps on them where you pump the water out. They actually worked. They were, it was, I mean, they weren't Martin Bakers, but considering, you know, you're basically jumping out in a Volkswagen, 
uh, it was a good piece of equipment. I mean, it's strange because I, I can't recall seeing that on any other military aircraft. What, why did they do that with the F-111 and not the regular ejection seat? Because basically the, the speed that we would be going at. And also, they originally designed the Navy was supposed to use it too, so I think that's why they did the boat part of it. Have you ever seen the uh, videos on the escape system for the B-58? No. Oh, man, you need to look at those. Okay. They used a bear to test those. <laughs> a bear? And, and what it was, instead of the whole uh, capsule coming out, this clamshell would close over the ejection seat, and then the seat would come out, but it would be like a pod, an individual pod that the guy was inside. And so they decided that the, the closest thing that they could test it with, I guess it was back in the 50s, you know, Peter wasn't around. So they said, ah, we'll use this, we'll use bears. And so they've got this this, and I've seen it on YouTube somewhere, where they're testing this thing and they're they're taking this bear and he's like all drugged up because there's no bear gonna do this of his own free will. So they put him in the in the seat and they strap him in and he starts waking up. And I swear to God, right before they close down, this the guy in the lab coat hands him a like a a ho ho, which is like a, a cupcake. <laughs> cupcake. This bear's sitting there and they close the camp and it takes off. And you know, they got cameras here because they want to show how the seat works and all that stuff. That bear's looking around, he's eating his ho ho, thinking that's all right, you know, it's nice, it's warm. I wonder what that hum is. And then that seat shoots out, and then they cut to where they find him and <laughs> They open up that thing, and that bear's eyes are like saucers. With your F-111 missions, they were nuclear, weren't they? Or or you had an element of conventional as well? We were basically there. Our primary job was deep interdiction. That, you know, hit, go beyond the, the front line and hit their supply uh, uh, depots, hit their airfields hit that sort of thing. We were like close air or, or frontline stuff. We were deep, deep strike was our primary mission. And we initially uh, trained a lot for uh, conventional strikes. In fact, I had a pre-planned mission that if the great war in Europe ever kicked off, I and seven of my close personal friends were supposed to attack this uh, PVO Strani field in Magdeburg in uh, Germany. So we already had that would have been our first first plan. We already already knew what my first mission would be if the Great European War ever kicked off. I mean, we were told when we got there that our goal in life was to survive a week, uh, take as many of them with us as we could before we'd go, and uh, try to make them use as many of their expendables as we could. And if the follow on forces from the states would win the war. Did you believe that? If it had happened, yeah. Then we would have took the brunt. And then the guys coming after us would have won. Assuming it didn't go nuclear. Even if it went nuclear. And what, what, what was your interpretation of winning then if it went nuclear? That they didn't march into America. Right. Sorry, England. but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So Europe would be this irradiated desert, yeah. but uh, yeah. But we'd be okay. And we take y'all back with us if we. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I mean, you gotta you gotta be realistic about that stuff. I mean, yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I never thought it would happen because I didn't think anybody was that stupid. You know, I, I've always thought that the the Soviets did what they did. My degree's in foreign service, by the way, so um, it was a degree to get you prepared to work for the State Department, but. I always thought that the, the Soviets did what they did. So if the next war came, they would fight it in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary, and not in the Soviet Union. That's what they wanted, have a place to fight besides their own country. Um, I, did, I never thought they were going to come west in an, you know, in an aggressive war. I never thought they would, and they didn't. You know, they're, they're more of, let me see if I can... You know, cause a little problem here and there in the periphery and, and get client states to do stuff for me. They're not coming west. Because they, they, they knew they couldn't win. I think they knew the consequences yeah. of that, that it wasn't going to end well. And to be honest with you, most of their stuff was crap. Now, they had a million of them. 
but it, it, they just didn't have good stuff. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question that because I I I think you know it's almost a lot was made of the threat of the Warsaw Pact crossing the border, but in reality. You know, and I've heard this from other people: is their equipment wasn't great, the morale certainly of the satellite states wasn't going to be great. Heck, they, their officers and men couldn't even communicate with each other a lot of times. You know, they grab a bunch of guys from Siberia and bring them out there. They don't speak Russian. Yeah, yeah. People forget that all the uh, multiple languages in the Soviet Union, as well as the Warsaw Pact languages, for that matter. And I'm sure there were a lot. Of, I'm, you think Poles want to die for Russia? No. No. No, they've, well, the Poles had a beef with Russia over a number of uh, bits of previous history as well. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it was uh, always going to be challenging. Um, so you, you talked about your conventional mission um for for Magdeburg with the nuclear missions did you know what your target was for that oh yeah we uh we said i guess i can talk about this now since it's all over we set nuke alert there at lake and heath had eight airplanes and uh after i'd been there about a year i got was made the alert force commander so i got to command them and we had pre-planned lines and you got there and you'd set for a week on alert and if it went, you knew exactly where you were going to go, exactly what you were going to do. And yeah, and where where were you going to go? Uh, I've had targets in Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Riga, and then there was the Murmansk run, which was one I usually got, and that was a Go drop your bomb, fly a couple of minutes, and jump out or ride it in. It's up to you. Take you know, take your choice because you mm. weren't coming back from that one. And could you just take me through how one of those missions would play out? So you'd be you'd be in QRA. Yeah, we'd be on alert, um, uh, and the war would have kicked off already. And to be honest with you, I'd, I'd be surprised if we were still there because we would have either been nuked by then or they would have dispersed to someplace else. But say we were still there, uh, the hooter would go off. We'd go drop in, hop in the plane, and then they'd read us the me- – the, uh, they'd read a message over the radio, and it was a series of numbers and letters. And then we had like a pad for that day, and we'd decode the message, and then we had uh, – cookies that you know basically were like a pen equivalent of a pen and if the cookie we had matched the numbers that they gave us we went so when you say cookie this was like a sealed plastic thing that you broke yeah. in half yeah, like a, that had yeah. paper yeah. that had the number within yeah. it yeah number yeah and then you know you take off and go do your mission you make it sound very straightforward but i guess if you're tr- I mean, well i mean it is <laughs> <laughs> you know the the situation that leads up to it's not. Yeah, I mean the actual nuts and bolts of what you're going to do is you know, and not rocket science. And and how did you feel about dropping such a a weapon on other people? Hey, I drop a nuke on you, I kill you with a baseball bat. What's the difference? Dead's dead. I mean, we kill more people in Tokyo with a firebomb than we did with a nuke in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You're just talking, you know, a question of magnitude. Was was, was I morally objected to it? Well, you know, <laughs> I recently did a uh, DNA test on one of this is Ancestry.com, and it turns out I come from a long line of, of lapsed Quakers. So it's interesting that I got <laughs> the profession that I did. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, it, you have to be a credible threat. To be a deterrent, you've got. I mean, you know. Let's be honest. I was basically a hired gun for the for the U.S. that they would draw or threaten to draw to get what they thought was in the best interest of the United States, and that was. And I had to be willing 
to dispense death and destruction in, in, in such a, an amount that the other guys didn't want to take it. Yeah, I mean, coming from a, a long line of Quakers, I get isn't the uh, the sack we had a long line of Quakers that had been kicked out of the Quaker Church. To be honest with you, I was going to say because yeah. I thought Sack's motto was "Peace is our profession." Yeah, war is their hobby. <laughs> Civilians just don't understand us. You, you can't explain. Again, I was a, I'm a I'm a hired gun, and people in combat arms are hired guns, and you've got to be willing to do unpleasant things under direction. We don't go out there and do it just because we want to, but, you know, when we're ordered to do something, you got to be willing to do it or you're not a credible threat and you don't accomplish what you really want to accomplish, which is what peace in Europe since World War II. Yeah, yeah. So the the flight in, you it's a low-level ingress with a pop-up just – It's a medium-level, like – Murmansk, for example, is a medium level. And this this was an interesting question I always had. My route went right over top of Stockholm <laughs> on the way to Murmansk. And we had to go at high altitude or, you know, medium altitude because of fuel. And I always wondered um, if they, you know, talked to the Swedes or or what. Yeah, because the, the Swedes were very protective of their territory yeah. during the... but I guess if we have been throwing nukes back and forth, that, you know, well, I guess all bets are off by then. Uh, they're probably glowing in the dark anyway by now, uh, just from the, you know, fallout stuff blowing both ways. But then, then you would drop down low level and fly low level into your target and drop your bomb. Or bombs. We had to. And was it sort of like you're lobbing the bomb? There, there were two deliveries. One was a toss, uh, and you and you throw that thing about six miles away. And I, that's one thing that always amazed me about the one eleven. You know, it, people talk about laser guided bombs and how accurate, you know, terminal guidance is. And back in the eighties, uh, now we had digital computers then. You could take your average airplane, your average whistle, go out, uh, toss a bomb from six miles away. That thing could go up to like. Well, from like a thousand feet for where it came off up to, you know, 26, 27,000 feet, then back down and hit the target six miles away. And these guys would consistently get it in within, you know, 100, 200 feet. Wow. Now you, you, you think about the difference in, you know, the air, the temperature, the wind direction, you know, all that stuff going up, down six miles away. And, and I mean, consistently get within 100, 200 feet, throwing that thing for six miles away, never seeing the target, doing it off radar. And then the other one was to go over the level and drop them level. But mainly they like tossing them because you got the air burst. Yeah, because if you drop them level, presumably there's some retarded detonation. It, yeah, a shoot comes out. and it, Well, the shoot comes out anyway. It, it kind of hangs when it does the air burst. But... Um, yeah, I mean, unless you like going underground or something, you usually did air burst. Yeah. yeah. And did you ever talk to your Wizzo about what your plans were after you dropped it? We were going to die. Afterwards. I mean, you know, you know we're going to jump out in the country. I just dropped the two nukes on. What do you think? I, d- I don't know. I mean, with the Murmansk run... I guess you might consider flying to... Plus, it's going to be cold as it's all get out up there. You don't have enough gas. You had enough gas to drop the bomb to an escape maneuver. Could you get to Sweden? Oh, God, no. You'd be lucky You'd be lucky to get outside of the, the city limits of Murmansk. Because, that, 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 like I say, that was a one-wayer. Oh, right. So that was at the extreme... Now, they were all one-wayers, actually. Yeah, was, that was at the maximum range this thing had. I mean, you weren't coming back anyway, if you thought you were. You're fooling yourself. Probably wouldn't anything come back to. You're, you're training for that for years. And as you say, I guess what gets you through it is you think it's never going to happen. Or if it happens, I mean, you know, might as well get my shot in before before I go. You know, I get, I get to throw a punch instead of just, you know, cowering in a hole somewhere waiting for them to come get me. I really appreciate you um, sh- sharing that, Rick. Now, I, I think that you were alerted for some potential missions in Lebanon at one point as well. 
Yeah, back before we went to uh, uh, Libya, we were down in, in uh, Spain, Zaragoza, and they had a really nice range down there. And we've been trying for years for the Spanish to let us in down there and use it instead of having to go to Turkey all the time. Finally let us in. Um, we're down there. And we come back from downtown one Saturday night, early Sunday morning, and there's a note on the door saying, hey, you know, you pack up, we're going back to the Heath. And we're going, yeah, right, that's going to happen. Because it was like just, you know, scribble note. It wasn't like an official order or anything. My God, 6 o'clock in the morning, they wake us up, and back we go. And we land, and we're walking in. They go, okay, you guys can go home except you, 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 and you. Get back in the planes. Go to Turkey. Oh, by the way, we're loading bombs on them before you go. So we... Flew to Turkey that same day, the insulate. We we landed at night. They stuck us in the hangars, closed them up, uh, made us take our squadron patches off, and made us stay on base. And supposedly we we're going to supposed to go bomb some place in Lebanon, but it never happened. And that happened a couple of times. And that's why we we're so surprised when we actually went. Right. Well, let, let's talk about Operation El Dorado Canyon. So. It's 1986, and the Libyan government is accused of uh, being part of a bombing of a uh, nightclub in Berlin that kills U.S. servicemen. The LaBelle Disco, and then they also blew up a TWA plane. So Ronald Reagan, who's the president at the time, orders uh, an operation to uh, bomb Libya, which is called Operation El Dorado Canyon. When when were you first aware that you might be on that mission? You know, like I said, this happened so many times. You were kind of like, you know, the on on the team, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if you were like, you couldn't go to London and you couldn't leave the base, and everywhere you went, you had to tell command posts where you were. So. Actually, it's the, the Saturday before the raid. We were having a Anglo-American friendship do at the officers' club, and when commander kept leaving, and he'd come back, and he'd leave, and he'd come back, and then uh, we were supposed to have a salty nation, which was a, a pretend war or exercises that we do every about once a quarter. They last a week. We had one of those starting Sunday, so we got called in. And we go in, and that, that the Sunday before, the day before is when it, we were told we were actually going. So probably 24 hours. And and what sort of intel did you did you have on uh, the targets, and what targets were you aiming for? There was uh, his house. There was a sports center, which had a pool that I guess they used to train frogmen. And then there's Tripoli Airport in the south. Those were the three targets. And then the Navy did something in Benghazi. I mean, you mentioned these other operations that got cancelled at the last minute. When when did you know that this was actually going to be for real? When we walked out to the planes. And and what about your? I mean, obviously, this is different to a to some of the. Well, it was a different mission to what you were probably expecting to do. Uh, what what were your instructions if you were shot down? We weren't given any. So it's just make it up as you go along. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't think anybody tried to make it to the water, I think, was the main thing. If we got on over the water, we'd be okay because the Navy would come get us. Otherwise, it's just, you know, you had your standard escape and evasion things that you did if you got shot down. Yeah, so you'd have... I guess you'd have a location beacon or something with you. Yeah, I mean, you had to, you know, get away from the capsule, you know, go high, make contact, and then try to find a place for them to pick you up. But they didn't have, like, any safe areas or anything like that. I mean, it just makes you think. I mean, whoever thought of that is, that capsule didn't really think through the whole escape and evasion piece, did they? Well, the main thing is, is survival. You go out of that airplane at 100 feet going 1.2 1.3 <laughs> you're not living through that so i guess it's you know six one half does the other yeah so how how long was the the flight i was the second one in the air last one on the ground and that was like 14.2 i think wow 
Was I think that was the longest mission. It was the longest tactical bombing mission in history. I mean, we could have flown that thing with the state yeah. in that amount of time. So was that even longer than the uh, Black Buck flight to from Ascension Island to the Falklands? Oh God, no! That one was. I think that one was like twenty something, wasn't it? They had an airplane; they got walk around in, and that one, though. And again, after eight hours, you know, seven eight hours, it's just a matter of degree. Yeah, you're you know coming through Gibraltar. Let's say you're getting close to to Libya. What's going through your your mind at that point? Because you've trained and trained for something like this, but this is where people are actually going to be firing at you and trying to get you down. Okay, people don't think I'm nuts, but I think I and the vast majority of people in that flight were going, well, thank God we're finally going to get to do what we've been trained to do. I can believe that. I, I, I can, yeah, I can honestly believe that because that's been your whole life for... Yeah, and there, hadn't, there really hadn't been anything, I mean, other than, uh, you know, Panama and Grenada before that. And we thought, man, we're never going to get to do this. We don't want to do nukes, and this is about as good as it gets, you know, one-off against some third-world country that probably isn't that big a threat to us. But uh, you have something happen that means that you uh, have to abort. Yeah, the uh, part of the, the terrain falling radar is a, it's a radar altimeter that uh, comes on, and it, it gives information to the terrain falling radar. And the autopilot, when we were let down, it wouldn't lock on. And the rules of engagement were if everything wasn't working, you had to turn around and come back. So You must have been cursing at that moment. Yeah, uh, I and the maintenance officer had a in-depth discussion when I got back. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine. 82 airplanes and you can't give us 18 flyers. Right. Yeah, that... But anyway, I mean, they did the best job they could do. It, it just happens. Plus, that was a long, bloody flight. Yeah, to then uh, have to, you know, come back. So presumably you you drop your bombs in the med rather than carry them back or... Yeah. You know, yeah. Now, I, I understand that one one of the F-111s was brought brought down uh, over Libya. Yeah, that was Fernando and Paul Lawrence's airplane. They were number... Five, I think, in a string of six. That's to this day, I do not understand that plan. Can you just take us through the the, the plan? Well, you know, if you go back and you look at linebacker in Vietnam War, it, you know, B fifty twos, same IP, same target run, same altitude, same axis of attack, same airspeed. You know, you could be the worst AAA guy on the face of the earth, and after about six, four or five guys come through, you got your timing down. And we're sitting there going, we're looking at this thing, and you go, you got six guys going, same IP, same target, same run in, same altitude, same airspeed. Have we learned nothing from linebacker? You know, first guy is, is going to see the target, second guy may see the target, third and fourth guys aren't going to see anything except, you know, you know, big puffs of smoke and explosion and camel guts and stuff flying around all over the, the sky. Fifth guy's going to die. Sixth guy's probably going to die. And that's pretty much what happened. Because the guy after him almost got hit. Right. And what, what number would you have been if you'd gone in? Second. But when we went to the airport, we came from two different axes of tax. Three from the south, three from the east, and I was the second guy from the east. Plus, they didn't have anything down there at the airfield. There weren't, there weren't any defenses down there. So, I mean, we could have taxied in and dropped those bombs off. Yeah, it must have been quite a sobering flight back, knowing that you'd, you'd lost some of your uh, comrades. We lose people all the time. I mean, uh, it was, yeah, it was, um, we're sorry we lost somebody, but it's not like we don't expect it. You know, and in, in, if you're in fighters, people are going to die. You know, it come, it's part of the job. It comes with the big watches and the pretty girls. You got it. Just it just is. And you hate to get cold and callous to it, but you are. You know, we like to say there's the 
three stages of fight or violent grief. Gee, that's too bad. Two, glad it's not me. Three, I wonder what he screwed up. And, that, mm. <laughs> and I mean, that's basically how we think about it. Yeah. Yeah, you have to move on. And we've got, and it happens so often, it, it, it's like a ritual thing. So Air Force kicks in and they do, you know, all the things that you do. And it's just like, it, it kind of takes the edge off mm. of it. Because presumably flying at such low level as you did in the F-111, the the attrition rate with accidents was high or not? Yeah, when you're at 200 feet and four, 500 knots, you screw up, you're dying. Um we put seven of them in the ground in one year. Wow. There at Lake Anita. And that was screw-ups, mechanical failure? Uh, well, you know, to be honest with you, nobody knows because, again, when you hit the ground going, like we had a guy hit the, well, if you did, you hit the side of a granite mountain going 600 knots. I mean, you're a basic chemical element. I mean, you're not fighting anything. In a lot of it's just disorientation, or the TFR failed, or pilot error, or who knows? You know, dead's dead. Yeah. Um, as as the nuclear alert force commander at, at Lake and Heath, what what did that role entail? Well, I was in charge of all the crews, all the maintenance, and all the uh, security, and we were like our own little. Actually, it's kind of like being in the joint. <laughs> you know, because you're, you're in double double fenced uh, barbed wire compound, you can't go out except you know uh, unless you're on parole, <laughs> and um, you pretty much stay there. And they control who comes in, who goes out, and just making sure everything. Because nukes are a zero screw up business, and so that your main thing is to make sure nobody messed up. Yeah, I've been in the uh, QRA at Upper Hayford because that's still preserved. Yeah, it's the same. It's they're, they're the same, pretty much the same. Um, you know, we'd get up every morning. We had our own mess hall. Uh, we'd eat, uh, go out, change over the classified because our our cookies and our our code sheets changed every day. Pre-flight the airplane, say hello to the bombs, uh, talk to the crew chief, talk to the cop. Each, each, you had your own cop at your. Uh, shelter and they had a we had a, a system where normally they they would look at your your pass your your card to make sure that you were who you said you were for and they let you in but on a, a scramble which we did probably at least once a week practice scrambles you know you'd run in you want to get going as fast as you can so they we had a number like say the number of the day was eight and if the guard showed you a five you showed them a three back right so I always told my guys, I don't give a crap what the number is. When I come by you, I'm showing you a one. <laughs> so, so you better be showing me whatever one minus is. Yeah. Okay, sir. And that, that's what we do. The last thing you want to be doing is trying to do some maths. <laughs> when you... yeah. Okay. Sometimes they forget what the dang number is. And I said, I'm showing you a one. I'm going in. And if they just if forgot what you'd do, you'd stop. You'd actually show them your, your uh, alert pad. ID. It, you know, it took a second. So it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, then, uh, during, after we changed out the classified and, and talked to the, the deck apes and the, and the cops, we'd uh, go back in and, you know, first day or two of the week, you pretty much stay in the facility and study your line. Uh, then, if you were an instructor, you'd go give sims, simulators. Uh, you had like your own truck and had like the uh, cop lights on it. Or you went back to your office and worked. And then after about, you know, normal duty hours were over, you'd go to the club and get something to eat. Or we had our own mess mess hall there. The cooks would come out and cook for us. Had our own gym. So we'd go out and play basketball or something and lift weights and had our own theater. So we get to see the first run Filipino kung fu movie that they had going around the the basis and uh, our watch TV and uh, both <laughs> BBC one, BBC two and ITV and go to sleep, do it again. And we'd be on for a week. 
And if something come up, I'd always, you know, I'd have to, you know, take care of it. They'd tell me if they were, like, doing maintenance on an airplane or if a plane was down or they had to swap out a cop for some reason. And, okay. But uh, I was just somebody that could, the wing commander could have to yell at if something happened out there. Yeah. Yeah. But it, very few things happened out there because people were serious around those things. That that was a career ender. I've interviewed one of the cops at Upper Hayford, um, and that was God. Their jobs. And that was interesting. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't do that for all the tea in China. I'd rather be a prison guard than do that. But you know, one time we were, we were having a, a salty nation coming up, so we were going to change over early on a Sunday. We usually change over on Mondays, but they were going to change over on Sunday to get the crew in before the salty nation started. Sorry, you you said salty nation. What what is that? That's that, that's the name for it. the exercises that we do to get prepared for our operational ready and inspections. It's just something they came up with. They got to call it something. Um, so we're out there playing basketball, and one of the whistles twists his ankle, like really bad. And it's about thirty minutes from changeover, and we're going, "What are we going to do?" And I said, "Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take him, get this pilot, stuff his butt in his cockpit." And we're going to wait until his relief comes out. Because if you think I'm calling the wing commander and telling him <laughs> that I get to do an early changeover because this numb nuts twist his ankle, they'll never let us play basketball out here ever again. <laughs> so we stuck them in the airplane and waited until it changed over, and then we took him over to the hospital. He's okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, can you tell me anything about the war games? Yeah. they were we, Again, we called them Salty Nations. And they would start out always at about three o'clock Sunday or Monday morning. The hooter would go off, and then we'd do a recall. And what that was is the command post would call the squadron commanders. Squadron commanders would call their uh, assistants and their ops guys, and there'd be like maybe three officers before them. And it was like a pyramid recall. Everybody would call somebody else. And then after you called the guy below you, you'd come into the base and you'd start. You'd bring all your stuff. And it ran for like uh, yeah, twelve hour shifts because mainly because that's the duty day limit was twelve hours for fly- flyers. First thing you do is you come in and then you uh, they give you an intel brief. There'd be a scenario like the war we fight the war up in Scotland normally, and like the Hadrian's Wall would be the FIBA Fort Edge of the Battle Area, and then all the bad guys would be in Scotland, and they do things like they give us intel briefs where the threats was and it. it kind of interesting sometimes they go okay if you see a green bus you know that's that's a column of of t-34s so we were you know to look at stuff so if we saw one of those we were supposed to report that when we got back you know just give you something to get used to looking for stuff because i mean that is one of your things you, you should be doing when you're rooting around back in bad guy country is seeing where everybody is and we get our missions and uh we fly them uh, evaluators would be with us. They'd chase us. They'd be following us all over the place. Uh, they would get the RAF and the the Belgians and the Dutch, although you didn't have to ask them. They'd come do it even when they weren't supposed to. Would come in and, and attack us on our way up to where we were going or coming back. Uh, about Wednesday, things weren't going to go, weren't going really well. It was time for what was called a cell rail, selective release, could release the nuclear weapons. So we'd send one or two out and drop nukes, and then that would obviously cause the the uh, the big war to kick off. And then Friday morning is when we had the elephant walk, and that's where they loaded every airplane we had on base that would fly with, you know, sim- well, they'd load the nukes. They'd load the, the practice nukes, which didn't have anything in them. And then they download them, and then we go out and we'd fly, you know, simulated missions. And every air, and every airplane on base would take off. I mean, it was awesome watching these things. I mean, like seventy airplanes taking off at once. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, like one after the other. And we'd win, and then come back and debrief and take the rest of the weekend off. And then you know, once a year, either you safety would come over, the United uh, Air Forces Europe, our guys, would come over and do an operational readiness inspection. It's basically the same thing. Oh, and we'd have like airfield attacks and stuff like that. And they'd blow up squadron buildings and they'd kill people and do kill removal and all that kind of stuff to see how you'd react or, you know, how you'd operate without the squadron or 
So did they simulate like a ground attack on the airfield as well? Oh, yeah. What they do is they'd have like uh, RAF for the Dutch and the Belgians come in and actually attack the field. And then the evaluator the on the ground would set off like a smoke bomb. At where the, the, you know, supposedly this guy dropped his bombs. And then you go over there and he'd hand you a card and he said, OK, this thing is like two thirds destroyed. And there's like 50 casualties and that kind of stuff. Or he'd point around, OK, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And then you're out. So the so you say for you would give us one uh, a year, and then on alternate years NATO would come in and do it. And what was the difference with with NATO versus? It's more fun. <laughs> it was more fun with NATO. Those boys had the big picture. In fact, we had a NATO attack about last one I was at was a NATO attack about, and um, they'd send a for some reason they sent a team over from from the state. And they hardly ever did that. It was usually you safety guys, but they sent tag guys over for this NATO tag about for some reason. Never understood that. And these guys had no earthly idea what we did or how we operated. NATO guys did. So anyway, we go through our, our drill. And come Friday, we get in. And man, we're smoking this thing. I mean, we're kicking butt. It's best tag about we have ever done in our life. And it turns out we had the, the best tag about of any wing in Europe that year. So we're, we're, you know, Friday, we're patting ourselves on the back, talk, you know, thinking about what, what good guys we are. And then the, the tag guy says, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, 3510 inspection, all fighter squadrons. And 3510 inspection is dress. And, uh, you know, we've got your hair cut, you have the right uniform. I don't know if uh, it, we're not like the RAF. We wear blues or dress blues for an official photo about every four years in their funeral. It's the only time we wear them. We never wear blues. But this clown wanted every pilot in his blues, dress blues, open ranks, inspection, that Saturday morning. <laughs> it was a fiasco. Uh, you know, because there's like guys who were out, you know, fighter pilots are fighter pilots. And there were guys that had the blues from like, uh, three sets ago we had the old outside kangaroo pockets on them. I mean, those things hadn't been legal for like years, but that's all the guy had. And oh, we just got ripped on the 3510 inspection. We failed it. So we're doing they're doing the out briefing, and the NATO guy who's in charge puts up his slides and he goes, Okay, you guys have been the best in, in Europe in this. Best in Europe in this, best in Europe in this, best in Europe in this. As he goes through each, each one of the things that they evaluate us on, gets to the third five ten inspection. He goes, but apparently you gentlemen don't know how to dress, but we'll just go pile that now. And, and that was the end of it. It's just typical bloody American Air Force. Well, I mean, you mentioned the, the other NATO forces. What was it like working with those other NATO forces? Well, I got to go over to a... Um, uh, they were doing doing some kind of uh, deal over. It, it was mainly a command post exercise, and it was over in Maastricht, uh, in Holland, and it was in this cave. It's kind of neat, and uh, it involved uh, you know us. Actually, French were at this one too. Surprise me, French guys, us, uh, Belgians, Dutch, Germans, Brits, and so. We got to, they sent us, sent me and another guy over there, and basically we wrote air tasking orders. They'd come down, here's the targets. You decide, you know, who, what wing was going to cover what target and what uh, bombs they were going to use, and then you write the order and send it out. And uh, everybody there was a colonel or above, except me and my guy, and we were both captains. <laughs> and, uh, there's this old Dutch Air Force general was running the place. And then, you know, we'd have like a two hour lunch and it'd be like, you know, China and linen, white linen and wine. And it was just, it was just odd. But yeah, I mean, we we got along with the, especially RAF, we got along with the Royal Air Force just fine. You know, once we mess, a lot of times we go up to, uh, we take the one elevens up and land and let them practice servicing them and loading them out just to, so they could get in case we ever had to divert in there after the war. They would know how to load the bombs and put the gas in the planes and, you know, oil them up. 
So we used to call that Lukers for lunch. <laughs> and we'd fly up like a RAF Lukers and hand it over there to them for a couple of hours. We'd go to the club and have a gentleman's lunch, come back and get it and try to figure out what it was they were saying because they were all Scottish people. <laughs> um, and, of course, we, we technically belonged to the RAF until the war kicked off. We had a, a wing commander, wing commander Mike, we used to call him, um, where if you did something – uh, sending us to mother country. We got to go call to wing commander Mike in one time. And I was in uh stand of I gave uh, flight evaluations and we'd had a long period of bad weather. So we hit a week where the weather was good. So I called one of the squadrons. I said, Hey, you give me eight airplanes. I'll give you 17 check rides. And uh, said, yeah, okay. So we got that scheduled up. And then I called uh, Lucas and another great thing about uh, flying in England was you could attack active airfields. You just call up the uh, air traffic control saying, you know, like, hey, there's Major Shreve out Lake and Heath. I'm going to do an airfield attack at Lucas at, uh, you know, 12.05 Z on uh, Friday. They go, okay. And what they would do is they, they'd stop flying in the area for like plus or minus two minutes of that and clear out the airspace for you. And uh, then I – Asked the guy, I said, call 111 Squadron and tell them we're coming. Tell them to try to stop us. He goes, okay. So he they called that. So we took off, and we scheduled some uh, bomb runs on some local air, uh, local ranges. And we're flying low level uh, to get up to Lucas, and we see the steam engine in the countryside. And, man, I tell you, steam engine to fighter pilot is like a car to a dog. Whatever you're doing, you stop and you chase it. Because, you know, you, you remember seeing the, the old yeah, yeah. pictures where they the camera gun the film. Smoke come up and they yeah. Pull, yeah, they pull up. So we come in, this, this thing's pulling into a station, and it's an old steam engine. I mean, an old-timey one. So uh, we roll in and do a bunch of bomb runs on it and then bugger off up to Lukers and have our mess around. We play silly buggers with 111 Squadron for a while, and then we come back and we land. We come in, go up to the desk, and the guy goes, uh, you up there uh, – Low Fly 14, which is Yorkshire. And I went, yeah, maybe. Why? He said, well, I just got a call from some guy at London Weekend TV, and he's really pissed. I went, what? He said, they were filming an episode of Sherlock Holmes <laughs> up there. And when they pulled into the station, they were attacked by a bunch of American airplanes. So apparently, since the F-111 is not indigenous, did water in the lean planet, uh, <laughs> kind of ruined their, their thing. And I went, the guy goes, well, it's on the notice board. And I went, is it? I went, look, oh, my God, yeah, it is. So he says, okay, go see Wing Commander Mike. Went, All right. So I took my whistle with me, which is a young lieutenant. He ain't been there about a year. So we go in. You know, Wing Commander Mike kind of sitting back in his, his – uh, he kind of looked like a 50-year-old David Mitchell, you know, if you, mm-hmm. you know, remember what he looks like, if he had, like, gray hair and yeah. stuff. Anyway, so he's leaned back. Kind of smile on his face, went for me to whip out some big, long, involved story. And I just went in and saluted and went, sir, I was the flight leader of that offending flight. That notice was on the board. I read it. For some reason, it just didn't register. It was me. I have no excuse. And he's, he stops for a minute and he goes, well, that certainly is refreshing. And he thinks for another minute. And then he makes the sign of the cross and goes, go and sin no more. <laughs> 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 that was all we ever heard Brilliant. of. It. What I mean, the the RAF commander. What was his role at the base? He, he's a liaison. He's a liaison. It's it's an RAF base, man. I mean, it's his base. We're guests. Was it his final say so as to whether you took off on a mission or not? No, 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 no. But he he can make trouble for us. We were there as guests of the, of the Queen, and so it wasn't our base. Not our base. Not our airspace. Not our country. Yeah. No, I remember they were they were always called RAF, whatever Lake and Heath, Upper Hayford. There, there must have been a number of times in your flying career when you thought that the um, result of your flight was not going to be um, good. Oh, you mean times I thought I was going to meet Jesus or Odin or the devil? Well, who, whoever you, whoever yeah. you think you were probably going <laughs> to meet, can yeah. you can you tell me about any of those? Well, one time I was up. Uh, we're flying up in Scotland, and I was giving this guy's check ride. And we're in this lock, and there's like granite mountains on both sides of us. And, and the weather starts coming down as it often did up there. 
and the clouds start coming down, coming down, coming down. He goes, I'm going to root aboard, which means he's, we're going to stop flying low level and he's going to uh, fly straight ahead and, you know, get until we get above the altitude of anything around us. And then we'd call uh, radar and get an IFR instrument clearance. The, the theory being was, we, we call it the big sky concept. The chances, I mean, if I tried purposely to run into an airplane, I probably couldn't do it five times out of 10, probably miss. So the chances of you hitting one accidentally is a heck of a lot less than you flying under the ground, which is 100%. So that, that's why we, we did the route of boards where we fly straight ahead. So he starts doing the right thing. He paddles off the train following radar, starts pulling up. I get in on the radar to look to see if I see any airplanes in front of us. And all of a sudden, for some reason, this idiot decides to try to turn around inside the lock. So he's got like five, six Gs on the airplane. My head slammed into the radar scope. I'm screaming at him to roll out because we're not going to make it. We, we don't have enough turn radius to turn inside the lock. So I reach over and just physically knock him off the controls, lean across there, throw the wings all the way out so I can get some more lift, roll, roll out, and pull as hard as I can. And we go up into the clouds. And we're looking on the radar, and I can see the side of the mountain coming to us. You know, it's, it's marching down the scope. And it got so close, I couldn't tell any difference between where it started and where it stopped. And I was expecting any minute now for that, you know, for us to hit the mountain. And we luckily scraped across the top of it and, and got out. And, uh, for, unfortunately, I forgot to turn the tape recorder off. So there's about 54 seconds of me calling this guy everything I can think of. And I don't use the same word twice. So they end up, we have these air crew meetings every Friday, about once a month. And if something like that happens, they'll like play it in front of everybody so that you can. They didn't care about your self-esteem back then. <laughs> <laughs> and then another time I was over in Turkey, uh, getting ready to drop a bomb, do a toss. We're down like two, 300 feet, going about 700 and I hit a turkey buzzer down there. And I mean, it's like, those things are like 40 pound birds. And it it just exploded in the windscreen. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I wonder what that was. And uh, if it had happened six months earlier, I'd been dead. Because they just put in new bird uh, resistant windscreens in. Because they'd lost a lot of airplanes from bird, hitting birds like that low level. And as it was, it started to crack. But uh, it held and we got back and landed. Wow. Wow. You know, that, that could happen to you at any time. So you didn't pres oh, yeah. presumably yeah. dwell on, on, on much on those, or you try to learn from them. We're like dogs. And I mean, you know, die, eat it, kill it, or mate with it. We're, we, we don't have deep thoughts about stuff. Just don't, which is good for our profession, I guess, but kind of makes it boring as people, I guess. And, but, I mean, people just – and that's the other thing. Like one of the biggest differences I found in the military and the civilian world. In the military, you go brief, go fly a mission, you know, hour, two-hour mission, come back, and you debate for like three, four, five hours. You spend about ten minutes on what went right because, great, that's what you get paid for. And the rest of the time, you would spend going over what went wrong, what you screwed up, and what you were going to do not do that again. And I mean, it got brutal. And I've sat there and t told uh, colonels in their faces that they had screwed up and got us killed, had to have been in combat, and they would take it. But the great thing about it was, was once you stepped out of that room, it's done. It's gone. You know, you know what you did. You know what you're going to do. Take care of it. So, so did you fly fly again with that guy in the lock? No, because right. he was like a student. Oh, okay, right. And he tried to kill me. Yeah. So he didn't do well on that flight. No, no, certainly didn't get top marks. No. And I, specific, and I specifically brief people, I go, okay, one of the things you can't do is try to kill me. <laughs> you scare me, but you can't try to kill me. Yeah, yeah. How, how long did you remain in the Air Force until... Uh, almost 14 years. 
87, 80, I think 88 is when I got out. And then what did you move on to? I uh, went to Pan Am. From flying an F-111 to flying a 747, let's say, must be a real. <laughs> well, I went to interview with Pan Am. Part of the things that you had to do was you had to do a simulator flight. And, you know, they got like 737s and 727s and DC-10s and 747s. So what do you take your your sim flight in? Sim 47. I'm a fighter pilot. I'm sitting there going, hey, first of all, I don't use wheels. I use sticks. And what are these extra two throttles for? And but and you sit there and you turn the wheel and then it it go like one potato, two potato, four thing would actually react because there was so much mass to the plane. That you, I mean, it's like taxiing a building. <laughs> uh, but I did okay. There were like probably three hundred of us there, and I couldn't tell you know a bit of difference amongst the. the three. I mean, we we're basically the same guy. Uh, my interview was with three old flying boat guys. We called them clipper skippers. Flew the flying boats back in the 30s. Wow. So I'm sitting there, and the guy looks at my resume and throws me a approach plate and says, what's that mean? And I told him. And he's looking at my resume and says, oh, you were in England. I went, yes, sir. He goes, then I, so I spent the next 55 minutes listening to World War II war stories. <laughs> and walked out and went, well, either I'm done or I'm hired. I mean, and, and I was like, I think they hired like 20 of us out of 300. So went down to Miami for 727 engineer training. About the second or third day that we're down there, they call us all into this conference room. And there's our, our union guys in there, uh, a couple of company guys, and a couple, a couple of suits. And um, they go, in the history of Pan Am, there have been times when the U.S. government has called upon us to fly special missions for them. And we do. We have, and we will continue to do so. The reason we're here today is we want to know if you want to volunteer to fly these missions. You don't have to if you don't want to. There's no extra compensation. Um, there's no stigma attached if you don't want to do it. But we just want to let you know that this we do these things, and do you want to do it if the opportunity comes? So, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And that's how we ended up doing Desert Storm. But it did 7-2 uh, out of uh, New York for a while. And then the neatest thing was I got to go over to Berlin for a couple of years on the 7-2. And this is back when the wall was still up. So you're having to fly low level there, aren't you, because of the air corridors? Yeah, go in one of the, court, the three quarters. <laughs> in my very first flight uh, in, in, uh, in Berlin, or I think it was the central corridor we were coming down. And I'm, I'm looking outside. And stuff's starting to look familiar. And I was talking to the captain. I said, well, this river up here is like been down to the, to the south and then back to the east. And then there's like a railroad road, railroad bridge combination. Said, yeah. He says, then there's like four power lines that cross it further on down. Yeah. He says, there's, is there's like this big castle thing off the left. He goes, yeah, what have you been down here for? And I went, no. He says, is there a big airfield down here? <laughs> <laughs> and we flew right over the top. Of that airfield at Magnum. Wow. That I was that was my target. How do I know this? how do I know all this stuff? And it was you know from studying the the target photos. There's further information in the episode notes which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Mark Labance, Frederick Esposito, Darren Hughes, Jim Black, Ryan Vlaming, Stephen Kavalich, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.